Now you probably all have heard that, you know, like the old saying or the old adage, it's like, um, if you get your car washed, it's going to rain the next day type of an idea. Well, I know if I want him to come in here, I'll just start lecturing and then he'll come in. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to at least start on chapter 23. And then as soon as he gets in here, you know, I'll, we'll pause. So chapter 23 is on link. I've heard it, that it means a lot of different things, but in here they say it's language integrated query. What it allows you to do is to use C sharp in this case, because you can use it with other languages as well. But it is a Microsoft tool that allows you to do the equivalent of querying databases and non-databases, all right, to get information out. So in this chapter, as it says, the author focuses on using link for non-databases. He does go into it uh, into the next chapter a little bit because there's other things that you can do. So he says he's going to focus on link and in-memory data structures like arrays and lists. And actually, it's pretty cool because when you think about it, if I had an array with 10,000 people in it and I wanted to be able to query that array to find out things, this is a really good tool for doing that. Well, we're, what we're doing is we're creating two lists, a list of employees, and again, that's all of you and me, and a list of projects. And we're going to be able to query them. And since they have a field in common, we're also going to be able to join the two tables together to get information. The examples that are in here are very simplistic. The ones in the chapter, by and large, are simplistic. And the ones that I'm going to give you are even more simplistic. And the author says at the end of the chapter, he writes the same program. And the first uses what's called link to objects to query two generic lists. And the second one is linked to data set where he uses tables. The output from the two of them is literally the same. So I'm just going to show you. I don't even remember which one this is, but I'm going to grab it. And this is the output. So it's kind of neat because what it does is it takes each customer. And for that customer, it shows you their invoices. All right. So you can see some customers have more than one invoice if you look at this. But again, in this example, I believe at least there are no databases that they're using in here to be able to do this. All right. Again, they're just they're just using generic lists. All right. So there's some concepts that you have to be able to understand. And one of the key ones, because you're going to see this in the example that I gave you today, is the difference between a query, like using query syntax and using what's called method syntax. And that's shown right here. First of all, link, as it says, is implemented as a set of methods that, were def that are defined by the enumerable and the queryable classes. That stuff was discussed back in Chapter 15. Not in a lot of depth and breadth of coverage. And it's not discussed in a lot of depth and breadth of coverage here either. It's one of those things where a lot of the logic that does certain things is abstracted from you. In other words, it's put into different classes. You just have to know how to call the classes. All right. So it says, the, because these methods can only be used in a query operation, some of these things, again, are called query operators. Now, you're used to saying things like, select star from employees where department number equals 13 something like that right well here it's going to look different it's going to look more like from departments where department number equals 13 select star that kind of thing so you kind of change the order around but the idea is very similar to what we've been doing with our queries all right and it says you can also query call these query operators directly by using what's called method syntax or method-based queries. All right. When you use classes, it says the result is known as a query expression. And there are going to be some examples that are going to show you that in just a second. So again, why do you want to use this? The, the biggest reason that you might want to use this is what I told you before. And that is the fact that you're able to query non-databases as though they were databases to get information. So it also leads, as it says here, into something that's known as object relational mapping. 
Okay, and that's another thing. We could have a whole class on this. All right, and as it says there with object relational mapping, also known as ORM, notice what it says. It's a technique for converting data between incompatible systems using object-oriented programming languages. I kind of mentioned this yesterday. So if I'm writing a system in one programming language and you're writing a system in another programming language, even if we have different types of databases, if I'm using Oracle and you're using SQL Server, with object relational mapping, we are able to converse with one another. All right? I mean, that's taking something that's a pretty complex topic and sticking it into a sentence or two. So they're trying to do a cell job here. And again, from where, you know what these are, order by. Notice order by is now one word. Not that that's a big thing, but you have to put it in as one word, all right? And when you order something in descending order, you use the entire word descending, okay? It's ascending by default, so again, you don't need to say it unless you want to say it. All right, so again, makes it easier for you to query a data source by integrating the query language with C Sharp. So the idea is, You've got both database people and you've got programmers. Sometimes the programmer is a database person or the database person knows how to program. But the bigger the company, probably the more segregated the jobs are going to be. And the idea is what they want to do is they want programmers who do not know databases to have to know as little as possible to be able to get the job done. All right. As it says, it makes it easier to develop applications that query a data source. In other words, there's built-in IntelliSense. Makes it easier for you to query different types of data sources because you use the same syntax regardless of what it is, where it is you're getting the data from. And it makes it easier for you to do this object relational mapping that I just showed you. So notice what it says. Link, language integrated query, provides a set of query operators that basically use a bunch of built-in stuff. You call this stuff and you, you know, and it converts the stuff into methods at compile time. Again, already said this to you, but a query that calls link methods directly is called a method-based, sometimes called a method syntax query. One that uses C-sharp clauses is called a query expression or sometimes called a query syntax. All right, and you use one of these and you can use them both. There are examples in this chapter of how to use both. And in the thing that I gleaned off the internet and rewrote a little bit of, both are used. All right. It says to use link with a data source, the data source must implement the I enumerable T interface that was discussed back in chapter 15. The good news is everything we've got in the examples does. All right. A data source, as it says, such as an array or an array list that supports uh, the non-generic IE numeral can also be used. So in other words, we, we would be able to use this stuff with the stuff we've been working on and looking at in this book and even with the sales order example that we've been working with. You could use this, all right? So next they talk about the fact that when you are running these, there's three stages of the query operation. The first stage, as it says, is to get the data source. Where is this data coming from? Then in the second stage, you define the query. All right. It says the query expression is going to be stored typically in what's called a query variable. The third stage is you execute the query. You may not want to execute the query right away. All right. And what you can do with these queries is you can use a process that's called deferred query execution. When you've got the deferred query execution, you go through these first two steps. So you go through the steps of finding your data source, all right, and defining your query, but you don't execute the query until you want to. What's the advantage of executing the query when you want to? You get the most up-to-date information, all right? And when you think about it, isn't that what you'd want? I mean, wouldn't marketing people want to know right now when I write the query, what product is selling the best or what product is selling the worst type of an idea. 
All right, if you do want to run it right away, so if you put all three together, and that's what I've done in here, it's called immediate execution. So deferred is when you create the data, you, you find the data source and you create the query, but you don't execute it. Immediate is when you create, you find the data source, you create the query and you execute it immediately. All right. So again, it might look, may or may not look a little goofy. I don't know. But here they're defining this. This stuff that's up here shouldn't be surprising to any of you. They're creating an integer array with six elements in it. Then they're looping through from zero to five, and that's what they're filling up the array with. So the array will hold zero, one, two, three, four, and five. No biggie. So that's your data source. Then you write this. This is the first time you've seen link. Again, from number in numbers. Number is The word number is a variable we're making up on the fly. Typically, you, your data sources are, are uh, plural, pluralized, and your variables in here are singular. All right, that's why for number in numbers. And it, what does this say? If the number is evenly divisible by two, what I'm going to want to do is select it, but I want to put all of them in descending order. Well, you know this, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. What's going to be considered an even number? 4 and 2 and 0. All right, and that's what you can see here is exactly what you get back as your output. All right, now typically when you do this, you use a for each loop. Okay, so it says here for number in number list. Well, the number list is the actual query expression that we set up. So for each number that's in there, what we're telling it to do is display it. And then after you do, Put a backslash n in there, all right. And <clears throat> you notice here they use this backslash t. They'll use this in, in further. In, uh, they're showing it to you now because in other queries, if they didn't do it, some of the output would be cut off, all right. And you'll see what I mean in just a minute. So again, they explain what deferred execution is. As it says, the query isn't executed when it's defined. Rather, it's executed when the application tries to access the individual elements. All right. If it's not executed when it's defined, then you have to put it into a variable. That's what we've done here with number list. Does that make sense? All right. So they start to go through these three steps. So number one, how do I how to identify the data source for a query? All right. And let's just take a look at the examples that are in here. Sometimes it's pretty evident. So what have they done here? They've created a new array of type decimal that's got four values in it. Value zero, or so this is uh, sales total zero, sales totals one, sales totals two, and sales totals three. And then, so that's what they're doing in step one. In step two, they're defining the query expression. It's pretty simple. This is a pretty simple array. And the output isn't going to be much. You know, all you're doing in here, I guess they'll show it again later, is they're just going to print out those four values. Now, typically, you'd have more associated with that, so you wouldn't use a sim simple array like this. You'd probably use some kind of a list or an array list where I could have first, you know, maybe the company and then how much they sold type of an idea. Because just showing four values probably isn't going to be enough to, to explain something to somebody to prove a point or whatever. All right. So what they're doing here now, notice, is they got a more complex example. They're using a class. So they've got this class that's got all these fields in it. You can see them. I'm not going to say them or anything. But now what we can do is we can go through the entire invoice. So we've got a list of invoices that's called invoice list. And that's going to basically get all of our invoices for us. And we want to be able to select each one. And all we're doing then is summing them together. So again, this is using one of those aggregate functions, all right, that we've talked about, sum, min, max, AVG. And I said there are other ones like standard deviation and variance, et cetera. All right. So as they mentioned there, the from clause identifies the data source. And in here it declares a range variable that's used to represent each element. All right. 
if the range variable you use in a query is in a query expression and the iteration is used in a for each is the same type it says you should give them the same name for clarity what does that mean well notice in here invoice list invoice list okay there should be some commonality here the only way you'd learn this would be to sit there and the way that we did in class where we went through those worksheets would be to write a work make a worksheet for this and have you go through it all right you can filter the stuff with a where clause you already know this so in this example that we looked at originally if you look right here come on you'll notice how many of these are over 2000 this one is not that one is over 2000 that one is over 2000 that one is over 2000 so when they go through here and they try to filter using a where clause and say only show us the sales greater than 2000 the one that was 1200 something is left off all right and you'll notice if they're just in the order that they are in the array so there is an order by that you can use on these to put them in ascending or descending order again typically with numeric fields you put them in descending order not always the case but quite often that's the way you do it so as it says, you know, just like we looked at when we when we did quote regular database processing unquote, the where clause allows you to filter the data in the data source by specifying a condition. These conditions can be fairly complex. You can use and, you can use or to combine things, for example. All right. As it says, the condition is coded as a boolean expression that can contain one or more logical operators. That's again is this right here. And it's totally legit that if you didn't you know if, so if instead of let's say in here they had put less than 150 and there were not any, then you would just show a message box with nothing in it. Doesn't mean that your your input's invalid. It means that you're there's no there's nothing that meets the criteria that you were looking. Just mention that sorting with order by. All right. And notice again, you use the, the whole word descending. I tried to play around with it yesterday, and I know that when I used DESC, it didn't like it. So when I put the whole word in there, it seemed to be fine with it. And the IntelliSense did not pick it up. It picked up descending. It didn't pick up DESC. So again, the order by clause lets you specify how the results of a query are sorted. And again, as it says, you can specify one or more expressions in here. So, you know, here we're doing it by what? We're doing it by invoice total in descending order. These Notice the last two totals are the same. Okay. And since they are the same, what we could have done, all right, it looks like they did it by customer ID here. But we could have done it by invoice amount where we would have gotten very different looking output. All right. So far, you know, they've talked a lot about getting everything, but what if you only want something? Well, this looks a little weird, but this is kind of what we did, what we'll do in the example here. So notice we've got a sorted list here. And it's a little bit more indicative of real life. In other words, it's got a person and their sales, another person and their sales. And now what we're looking for in here is we just want the names of the people who had sales greater than $2,000. And Anderson did not, so you can see in the example here, Anderson is left off of the list. You could have printed both of them out. So you could have printed the name and then the amount if you wanted to do that. They're just keeping it really simple here. So when they actually put the query expression, is notice what they're doing here. Select new invoice.customer invoice.total. So in that case, you'd want to be able to list both of them out. All right. So you already know this. The select clause indicates the data you want to return. This may or you may we may or may not have talked about this word before. If you don't want everything, so if you only ask for a limited number of fields, it's called basically you're you are you are creating a, what's called a projection. All right. So as they say, to return one or, or two or more fields, I should say, from each element, you code an object initializer. 
That's what this is right here. These are object initializers right there. All right. If it doesn't specify a type, an anonymous type gets created for you. Well, they didn't say that this was a string and this was a decimal. They didn't set it up like that, but it was inferred by the system. Joining data, as they mentioned here, with two or more data sources, you already know this. They're using their syntax. I believe that the syntax I showed you would work just as well. I didn't try it. All right. But what are we doing here? Well, it says we want to join our customers and our invoices because the customer information is in one table. The invoice amount is in another table. So not only do we want to join those tables, but we only want to show the ones, all right, where the invoice amount is greater than 150. And then we want to order it in ascending name, in order rather, based on the customer name. Again, you could just as easily have changed this order by in here to flip it around. We could have said invoice dot invoice total descending comma customer dot name. Also notice in here, they fully qualified everything. Even if you don't have to, it's always recommended. So customer dot name, invoice dot invoice total, et cetera. You already know most of this, but as mentioned here on the bottom of the page, the join clause allows you to combine data from two or more data sources, but they have to have a field in common. All right. The query results include only those elements that meet the, the conditions that were specified, in this case, in the where clause. And it's possible to, make, to, to join from additional data sources. So in other words, all right, you could join from more, more than two tables or more than two arrays or whatever. I've never tried doing this, but I even believe, for example, you can join from different types of data sources. I think I could join, for example, uh, an array that I had with a spreadsheet, for example, something like that. All right. Probably the hardest part of the chapter is the next four or five pages because they talk about lambda expressions. And I would say that if nothing else, I would, I would highly encourage those of you who will be taking the AWD1111 class, the node.js class in fall, to take a look at this. Maybe not now, but even before the semester starts. We've looked at lambdas before. If you remember when we did our getters and setters, we used that what I call fat arrow syntax with the equal sign followed by the greater than sign. That's, that's using a lambda expression. All right. So it says you should know three things about code that implement methods like this. First, as it says, it's a static method stored in a static class. What does that mean? If it's a static method, it belongs to everybody. In other words, if I, if I write seven different classes, they can all use the methods in that class and they share them. All right, so there's only one and it's shared. Second, the data type of the first parameter of the method identifies the .NET class or structure that it extends. So you need to give it a little bit more information. Third, the declaration for the first parameter is preceded by the keyword this. So again, for lack of better words, what they're saying here is we want to be able to write our own method to be able to interact with this information that we're getting. So if you notice in here, they've rewritten their, their, or their, written their own extension method. Now, why they, they use periods in this example, I'm not sure. I would have used dashes, but it works just fine. All right. Since they have only a single separator in here, all right, it would be three three digits and the separator, three digits and the separator. I mean, could you go in and write your own uh, function like this that used parentheses, three numbers, parentheses, and then the yeah, you could have done that. You would have needed three different separators if you would have written it this way: one separator for the left paren, one for the right paren one for the hyphen or the period or whatever it is you're going to use. All right. As it says, extension methods used to implement common C-sharp clauses for length. Well, if you don't implement these, most of them, for lack of better words, are implemented for you. But notice when you use those, they're capital W, etc. See that? All right. 
So as it says, it, for, they provide for adding methods so you can go and take what you've got and extend it. Hence the word extension methods. All right. So they go into Lambda expressions. And they say there, back in 13, they, chapter 13, they talked about lambda expressions. And again, this fat arrow type of syntax. In short, they go up and show you this as a little bit of review. A lambda expression is a function without a name. A function without a name is also called an anonymous function. Typically, when you've got a lambda expression and you write it like this, and you have an anonymous function, the idea is it's going to be a one and done. In other words, you have to call it once, it does its job, and it's done. And you don't have to go through all of the work to make it a named function. Anything you do with lambda functions that I know of, you can do without lambda. And you can just write regular functions, but it typically results in less code. It's clearer code after you understand the syntax, and it's crisper code. It'll execute faster. All right. So they show an example here on the next page. So when we look right here, where is it? There it is. All right. And as it says, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, what I want to have happen is I'm going to grab and I'm going to put into a variable called invoice over 50. And what I'm going to use for this is whatever is in total. And my condition is that total must be greater than 150. So whatever you find that's greater than 150, append that and keep adding it to invoices over 150. All right. And here's, a, here's another one. All right. Now, again, notice in this example, because this stuff is case dependent. So notice the where, the order by, the then by descending, and the select all start with a capitalized letter. All right. They, said, they say they're on the bottom of the page. When a link query is compiled, it's translated into a method-based query. To code a method-based query, you use the lambda expression. Again, consists of an unnamed function that evaluates a single expression and then returns its value. All right. And lambdas are used all over the place in many, many, many different programming languages. Most programming languages of any merit allow you to use lambdas. JavaScript does, Java does, C Sharp does, etc. All right. So again, I've already shown you this, but the chapter ends by going through two different examples. All right. And each of these examples, as it says here, presents an application. All right. The first one, as it says, it says the interface consists of a single form that lists invoices by customer. This list is stored by invoice total in descending order, all right? And the output is displayed in a list view. Now, we haven't done much work with list views, really, okay? But it's just, it's a big area, and it holds collections. So every time you want to add something to a list view, it's the name of the list view dot items dot add, and then whatever you want to add to it. That's it. So as it says, this first example uses a list view control to display a list of invoices for each customer. The list is sorted by invoice total in descending order within the customer name. So notice here, Sarah Cumberland, you've got her invoices, and you've got 238.16, 178.288, 64.49, but they're in descending order based on that. You could have done them if you would rather by invoice ID or by invoice date. All right, probably doing it by amount or by date makes more sense than doing it by invoice ID. All right. As it says here, to make this work, the view property of the list view control is set to details. This causes the data items to automatically be displayed in columns. And the width of it's typically going to be just as much room as it needs to put in each field and a little bit of space in between. You can always go and click on here and drag it over, et cetera, if you want to or need to do that. In addition, it says the headers were added using the column header collection editor. All right, so in other words, you don't get these by default. 
but you can add them is what they're getting to. Now, I'm not going to go over the code because, again, we could spend a lot of time on this, but I just do want to hit a couple high points. First of all, again, up here, this is very similar to the example that we'll go through. These are getting your data sources, so that's step one. Here is step two, and in here, we're formulating the query. So when you look at this, again, from invoice in invoice list, join customers, so we want to be able to use both tables. We're telling it what to join on that right here. They both have a customer ID. We want our results ordered by customer name in ascending order. And if the, the same customer is in there more than once, we want it by invoice total in descending order. And then it's the fields that we want to select. So again, this is one of those deferred execution queries. So after we've done all that, we use this for each. All right. And this is what's filling up the list view for us. So as mentioned here, now again, it says the link query used in this app makes it easy to include data from two generic lists. No, it's not. When you first start working with it, it's not easy, but it's fairly intuitive if you break it down like I just tried to break it down with you is what I'm saying. Okay. It says without link, you'd have to code your own procedure to get the customer name from the customer list. And then you'd have to add it. So it's more code. It's more problematic. It's easier to make a mistake. The link query used in the application also makes it easy to sort the results based on two fields. All right. Then at the bottom of the page, the code is the same shown earlier in the chapter, and it's pretty much the same that'll be shown in the next example, and the invoice and the customer data are stored in text files. All right, it says it could have been put in a binary file or an XML file or even in a database. So they redo this then when they grab the information and instead of grabbing it from a couple of lists, they're now going to grab it from database tables. So they show you the schema right here. I'm not going to go over it. Hopefully you can look at that and it makes sense. But again, the key point here is notice that both customers and invoices have a customer ID field. Because what we want is the customer name and we want their invoice total. Since they're in two different fields, or I'm sorry, since they're in two different tables, we must have a field in common between the two tables so we can link them. So as it says, all, the, the data set has all the columns for the customer table, all the columns for the invoice table from their MMA books database. It says because the customer invoice app doesn't use all the columns, the data source could have been defined so it includes only the required columns. All right, if this was all we were doing, technically we could remove everything from here except the first two fields. And we could remove everything from here except the you, you leave the primary key in, but the customer ID and the invoice total. All right. Now, there's a wizard that you can use with this. Notice it says, the data set used for this application was generated from a data source configuration wizard. Who cares? Well, the reason that you might care about it is that when you run through the wizard, it's the same wizard we ran through before. But where we ran through it and we checked just the data set, we ran through, boom, boom, boom. There are other options in there that you can use as well. All right. So, I mean, that's it for the chapter. Like I said, I'm not going to go through chapter 24. I just, I can't do it justice by going over that. All right. So, the example that I gave you, let's just take a quick look at it. In fact, I'll bring it up here first. Again, it's called Link for Beginners. So this is what she sets up, all right? As it says, as the name suggests, using Link, one can directly query data using the C-sharp language, all right, as opposed to just using a database SQL language, all right? Link can be used against any set of data that implements this. For example, lists, okay, and that's the one that she uses in here. So again, this is her employee class. I originally ripped it apart, but then I put it back together again, kept it just like she did. This is pretty darn simple. 
an ID, a name, a project ID with getters and setters. So there it is. Then there's the project. Again, really simple. Project ID and project name, getters and setters. Does it make sense to everybody that what we're modeling here is we're just modeling tables? Does that make sense? All right. So she comes in and creates these two lists, an employees list and a project list. And again, you don't have to do this, but it's pretty much convention that when you're doing this, you make these names plural. All right. And then when you manipulate them, as we'll do in just a minute or see how to do, then it's singular. So what does main do? Main is the only thing in here. Everything else is done basically inside of here that you'll see in just a minute. But what main does is it creates the two lists. So it's going to fill the employees list and it's going to fill the project list. This is the one, again, that I manipulated. So in the example that we have, if I go back into the program file here, again, this is what I changed. So there's me, there's Gabriel W, there's Nick, Nicholas C, Gabriel B, Aaron M, James W, and Christopher G. Okay, and I put all that stuff in arbitrarily. It did, there's no meaning to it. All right, and then here's the two projects. Again, what she's got in hers, she for project name, she just, it, it's not nonsense, but it almost is. It doesn't read all that well. And I'm not saying mine is better. I'm just saying, you know, that I, that's why I did that. So again, there was your employee class, there was your project class. They're both really, really simple. And when we look in here, well, you'll notice that these were declared outside of any routine, so they're available without having to be passed any place. And then main just calls initialize employees to set up our seven employees and initialize projects to, to initialize our two projects. Then it's just one query after another one. So again, if you look in here, this again is defining the data source. All right, so from the employee table or employees table, for each employee where the employee name ends with an S, select that employee's name. That's it. And then we write it out. And we use a for each because the minimum number of, of records we could be returning is zero. The maximum number of records we could be returning would be all of them. All right. So we're using an array here so we can parse all the way through it. Now, if you look here, the difference between these, if you look, this right here is doing it using the query syntax. And this right here is doing it using the method syntax. The method syntax results in a little bit less code. Many people will tell you they like the query syntax better because it's similar to something they're already used to using, all right, in SQL. But again, notice, all right, we've got a capital W here. If I put in a lowercase w, see how I get an error? See that? So it is calling the built-in where method right there as we looked at in class. In fact, if I change this to a W, a little W, not only do I get an error, but if I put my, my cursor there, all right, it comes up and it says, the employees class does not contain a definition for lowercase where, and no accessible extension method where is found, meaning we could write our own where with a lowercase w if we wanted to or needed to, all right? All right, then we've got another one. We're just doing this with the order by. It's the, basically the same query that you just saw, but in between the from and the select, like we had here, there we did a where. We're not even doing a where, so we're saying show us everybody. But when you do that, order it by employee name. Make sense? All right, then we're printing it out again in a for each loop. And we do, we, you can see it both using query syntax and using method syntax. All right. And again, notice the order by the O in order and the B in the B and by 
are both uppercase. All right? All right. Then we do the same thing, the exact same query, but we're doing them in descending order. Okay? And again, just to show you this one last time, when I run this, taking it from the top, again, there's our, there are the two people in here whose names technically end with an S, with the way we put it. Here are the two people in here whose names begin with a W. Remember, we're putting in his last name, comma, first name. All right, we'd get totally different results if we either put it as two different fields or we put first name, last name. All right, and then we run that, so we show them an ascending order, and you can see that. And this is with the query syntax, the one I just showed you. There is with the, is doing it the same way with the method syntax. The results are identical between the two. Then we do them in descending order. And again, you can see again that the results are identical between the two. All right. Then as we work our way through here, notice we've got there's a lot of blank spaces in here. I'm not sure why. I was adding stuff and removing stuff as I was doing this, but. All right, so we've got a then by. I'm getting that error because I, I'm still got the program running and it doesn't like me making changes, but that's fine. All right, so again, this was the, the one with descending order. Okay. <clears throat> now, next, what are we doing? Well, we're saying in here we want to order it by project ID, then by employee name. So if you've got two different employees who work on the same project, okay, so there's a tie, so to speak, on that field, then we want them in the employees shown in descending order. We do it first with a query syntax right here, and then we do it with the method syntax. Again, notice the then by descending, all right? And I guess it looks like I didn't do this, but I should have printed this twice, so this may only print once, I don't know. Let's take a look at what was in here. I guess they are both in here. So again, notice name, project ID, name, project ID. And the project IDs are in order because we told it to do that first. But then notice there's four people, me, Christopher, Nicholas, and Gabriel B that work on project 100. So then we said, take what's left and put them in descending order based on the name. All right, no, I did not do that because so I'd go first, I could care less. All right, you see it with both syntaxes. All right, then next, we've got what's called a take. You may or may not remember this, but when we were working in PHP My Admin and we were getting back, let's say 500 customers, we only wanted to see the first six, we used the limit statement that's the same thing you do here. If I wanted to, to just see the bottom two, all right, we could have done this and then done an order by in descending order and just taken two. Does that make sense? So you can grab from either end for lack of better words. So this is going to show us, all right, in this case, it's gonna show us the first two names. So it was me and I think Gabriel Breeding because I think that's the order I put them in. The skip is kind of the opposite of the take. The skip says, show us everything except, in this case, the first two. All right. And again, the examples are simple in here. Yeah, you can come in now. The examples are simple in here, okay? But uh, we could have extended them. Okay, so I'm going to pause right now. Then I'm going to just quickly finish this up. We were almost done anyway, but... Uh... We had left off talking about the skip, where you can skip a couple. Grouping, if you don't know what grouping is, again, group by is something that you can use. We didn't do much of it in the uh, on PHP My Admin, but for instance, if we wanted to group by category type of thing. Well, here we're grouping by project ID, and that's why the one that showed that there were four working on one project and three on the other. All right. And again, you can get as granular with this kind of stuff as you want. First, to just show you the first one, 
And you'll notice I took this stuff out here where an employee name starts with Q. That doesn't make a lot of sense here. And um, we could have had like the first one whose name starts with a W. Well, then it would have found U because WH is, comes before WI type of thing. All right. Then there was the first or default. So when you use a default, you can basically say, if you don't find it, you can put a default value in there. And then there was just the joins. All right, so there's just a regular join right here. And there's a left join. I think I went over the difference between the two, but virtually all the joins we did are what are called equa joins. All right, and with an equa join, they have, like, like if you do an equa join on customer ID, they have to match. If you do a left join that says, show me every record in the left-hand table, the first one, even if there's no match in the right. And from the, the right-hand table, only show me the ones that match the left. Does that make sense? And you can do with either left or right, right types of joins. And it's just which table you list first or second. That's it. So that's pretty much it. Like I said, tomorrow I will go through and, and go through a very simple example of how you could piece together. And I, I mean, I had a woman a couple of years ago who um, she started mid-semester and she wasn't, didn't really pay a lot of attention a lot of the time. I'm not trying to be mean, but she just, by her own admission, she didn't. And um, I showed her how to use Mobirize. And in like about a half an hour, she created her own portfolio. Was it great? No. But out of 150 points, she got like about 120 on it. So, I mean, that wasn't for, for the amount of time she put into it. It wasn't, it was a, a pretty good investment. It helped her pass the class. All right. Okay, so that's all that I had then.